medical students. Um, my fellow researcher, Vitor Pedrosa, and I, as Dr. Yielding said, were part of the annual math research program. And so we got to present at the Pacific Inland Mathematical Undergraduate Conference, as well as this symposium. So we'll be discussing knots, stick knots, and pseudo stick knot rejections. All right, so without further ado, what is a knot? Most people would think of something you'd use to tie your shoes, but mathematically speaking, it is slightly different. Essentially, in mathematics, a knot is formed by taking an infinitely thin piece of string, tying a knot in it, and then gluing the ends of the string together. So here we see a table of all the knots uh, with up to nine crossings. And um, they get progressively more and more complicated as the number of crossings increases. And it begins with the unknot, which is just a single loop. And then right next to it, we'll see uh, what is called the trefoil knot or overhand knot. All right. So the motivation to begin studying knots began when William Thompson, also known as Lord Kelvin, suggested that different uh, atoms were actually different knots tied in the ether that was believed to permeate all space. While this was subsequently shown to be untrue, um, it was not before an interest in knots was sparked in mathematicians for centuries to come. So not only is knot theory a uh, fascinating discipline in and of itself, but it's also uh, has a wide range of other applications such as electrodynamics, synthetic chemistry, and theoretical physics, just to name a few. One example in synthetic chemistry is that of DNA, which is the molecule that encodes genetic information in our bodies. Long strands of DNA have to fit into the tiny nucleus of our cells, and this is much like trying to fit 200 kilometers of fishing line into a soccer ball. As you can imagine, this is, uh, can sometimes interfere with the function of DNA, but what biochemists have found is that there are actually enzymes within the nucleus of our cells that perform not theoretic operations on the DNA, allowing it to fold and unfold in certain ways. So they have enlisted mathematicians to discover exactly how these enzymes work. And even though knot theory is a relatively new arrival to the mathematical scene, um, it has quickly found itself useful in a wide range of other mathematical fields, such as topology and hyperbolic geometry. So now we'll move on to some definitions. A, a knot is a simple closed curve in three space. Here we see, once again, the trefoil knot, which can also be thought of as a union of infinitely many line segments, so many that it appears smooth. And that definition allows us uh, to more clearly see the relationship between a knot and a stick knot, which is a knot in three dimensions made up of rigid line segments called sticks. So here on the right is what's known as the trefoil stick knot. And while it looks somewhat different than the regular trefoil knot, um, it actually corresponds to it, even though this is kind of spiky and this one is smooth, they can be said to correspond to another. And in fact, you can do uh, this with any knot. You can create a stick knot that corresponds to it. So a projection is a two-dimensional representation of a stick knot in three space. So knots are three-dimensional objects. So we have to have a way to represent them on a piece of paper so we can more easily visualize them and manipulate them. And so we do this using projections and we simply uh, represent parts of a knot that cross underneath another part of the knot uh, by making breaks in the line segment as shown here. Another type of projection is called an irregular projection, which is when three points in the three space project the same points on the knot and any vertex either projects to the same point or any other point on the stake knot. And this is just a complicated way of saying that this uh, projection right here is irregular because it has been constructed in such a way that part of the knot is not visible to the viewer. This other part that crosses over it uh, obstructs it from the view. So we tend to avoid these types of projections since 
uh, they can be quite deceptive um, in how they appear. And finally, a really important type of projection that we studied was called a pseudo stigma projection, which is a regular projection that cannot be realized in three space without increasing the number of sticks. So this image in the center is actually a pseudo stick knot projection. And while you might think, well, it's connected and it looks like it would be possible, I mean, nothing's bent. What you'd find if you actually try to construct this in three dimensions is that it would be impossible without breaking one of those lines. It's much, uh, th this image is an illusion, much like the works of M.C. Escher, such as his simultaneously ascending and descending staircase, which looks viable on paper, but is obviously impossible in the real world. And that leads to an important question, namely, what is the minimum number of stakes that we need to represent a stake knot? And uh, we know this for specific knots, such as this trefoil knot, uh, we know it's six, any less than that will result in a broken stick. But given any knot, uh, we, it's still an open question what the minimum stick number is. So we uh, will use um, we will use the various tools of knot theory uh, to analyze and visualize uh, visualize these knots um, to hopefully get closer to answering that question. So now I'll turn it over to Vitor, and he'll take you through a couple more definitions. Thank you, Ambrose. Um, next slide, please. So when you're dealing with knots, we need a way to manipulate them. And we do that through rider master moves. Um, there are three types of the move. There's three types of moves. The first one's called twist. Thank you. Um, which pretty much means that you can, if you have a line segment, you can twist it and you can untwist it and it won't change or alter the fundamental characteristics of a knot. Um, the second one's called a poke which pretty much means that you can poke line segment over another one and you can just undo that by moving it, moving it away. And the third type of random master move is called a slide, which means that you can slide a line segment over or under a different knot and it won't change the fundamental characteristics. Um, next slide, please. Um, another, since we're dealing with random master moves, we need to be able to tell if something is equivalent to the other thing. Um, and we do this by the term isotopic um, next. So for example, on the left-hand side, we have the unknot. And the right-hand side, um, all we did is that we flipped, um, we twisted top and we twisted the bottom. And we got what we call um, an isotopic knot because you can just undo those by untwisting. And you get something that's equivalent. Um, another definition that we came up with is a partial stick knot, which simply means that um, if we have a stick knot, for example, on the left hand side, the trefoil knot, we can just select um, a, a few sticks of the collection and we can make a new knot with that. Um, so, for example, next one. Next slide. Um, we can select the green knots, um, the green sticks, and we can make a new sub collection that's just equivalent to it by selecting um, the sticks that we want to work with. Next please. Perfect. So what's the motivation behind um, this knot stuff? Because it seems a little bit pointless at first. Um, similar to graph theory, um, we conjecture that there's two different types of pseudo-knot projections that appear in any other large collection. Um, so graph theory and planar graphs, we know that if a graph contains k5 or k33, it's known planar. No matter how big the graph is, if there's any of those subgraphs in there, it's it's not going to be planar. And we conjecture the, the same thing applies for pseudo stick knot projections. If no matter how many sticks you have in a collection, if any of the two knots, which we'll show you in the next slide, appear, then we assume that the larger collection is also pseudo. Next slide. So there's two different knots that we found or projections that we found that cause um, a break. The first one's called the internal crossing, mostly because the break happens at Q6 um, by the way we laid our axes. And the second one is called the external crossing because the break happens once again at Q6. But the internal crossing, if you use your imagination, like most mathematicians don't, <laughs> um, there's an A frame here. And you can see that the break happens within the A. And for the external crossing, the break happens outside of the A. Perfect. Next slide. 
So now we're just gonna prove that a break occurs. So first things first, we're gonna set the blue line on the x-axis and we're gonna set the point Q3 on the y-axis. So all those have um, a slope or incline of zero. Now we're gonna lay the blue stick, I mean the purple, oh my God, I can do my colors. The orange stick, um, since it crosses under the x-axis, um, it has a negative z value, but since it cro crosses through the y-axis, um, implies it has a positive z value at a P8. Next slide. Um, now here's where the fun starts to occur. If you look at P5, P4, since it crosses under the x-axis, crosses under the x-axis or the blue line, and it crosses under the orange line, it implies that everything is negative. It's inclined downwards. But now, if you look at the green line, since it crosses over the x-axis and over the orange stick, it means it has a positive z value. Everything there is inclined upwards. So here's where we have a contradiction because at Q6, since we're dealing with sticks, you can't have a stick that goes from being negative to positive. That implies there's a break. You know, um, if your stick is bending, it's not a stick. Um, and due to how we set our axes, the break occurs at Q6, but you can easily just change, um, you can change your axes and the break could occur anywhere with our sticks. But for our scenario and how we set it up, the break occurs at Q6. So we know that break, it's somewhere. It either breaks on the green line or the purple line. All we know is that something's broken. Now I'll pass it off to Ambrose and he'll do the external crossing. All right, thanks Vitor, let's see. Okay, so we're gonna prove that the external crossing is a pseudo stick knot projection in a similar manner. So here, uh, remember that we're looking at this knot from above, if you will. So the Z axis is coming out towards you from the screen. And we're gonna lay the blue stick on the X axis and P3, this point right here on the Y axis. So all the Z values of this blue line and this blue point are zero. Now notice that this greenish line right here, P3, P7, crosses under the X axis at Q2. So we know that it must have negative Z values along this whole line, except for of course P3, which has a Z value of zero. Okay, so this pink line, P2, P, uh, P2, P6, um, crosses under P3, P7 at Q1. So we know that Q1 must have a negative Z value. Um, also, notice that P8, P4 crosses under the x-axis at Q4 and under P3, P7 at Q5. Therefore, we know that uh, Q4, Q5, this segment of the yellow line, must have negative Z values. Uh, also observe that this pink line crosses over the x-axis right here. So we know that it must have positive Z values. Um, therefore, we know that this segment of the stick from here to the end must have positive Z values. However, this crosses underneath the yellow line. So in other words, the Z values on this line at Q6 are positive while it's underneath it. And the line that's above has negative Z values. And this is impossible. It contradicts the very definition of a line segment. The only way this would be possible is if this line, which has positive Z values, went from positive Z values suddenly to negative Z values, and then back to positive Z values again. And that would create a break in the line, which again, contradicts the definition of a line. So therefore, uh, by this contradiction, we know that the external crossing must be a pseudo stick knot projection. So now I'm gonna hand it off to uh, Vitor and he'll finish this off. Thank you, Ambrose. Um, as mentioned before, we conjecture that every pseudo stick knot projection has a partial stick knot projection that's isotopic to either the internal or the external crossing. So no matter how many sticks you have, if either of those um, partial stick knots appear in the collection, we conjecture that it's gonna be pseudo as well. Next slide. So in our research, we also developed an algorithm which helps you find the internal and the external crossing. If you go to our next talk presen presented by Kaden Ricker and Jose Orozco, you can see how it works. Um, that should be tomorrow at 11 a.m. So even though we accomplished a lot through our research, there are still some questions that remain. The first question is, 
are there more than two um, pseudo signal projections that cause a projection to be pseudo or two partial signal projections? Um, we only found through two throughout our research, but there could be more. Second question is, how many sticks does it take to fix um, a pseudo signal projection? So we know there's a break that occurs, but how many sticks do we need to throw at it to make it not break or to fix or break? And how can um, fixing these projections help us find better lower bounds for stick knots? So we know for the trefoil with six, since five creates a, a pseudo projection, so how many sticks we need to add to our pseudo projection to cause it to be no, non pseudo anymore? This could help us find better lower bounds for our sticks. And now I'd like to conclude. Um, we'd like to thank Dr. Amy Yielding, who taught us about knot theory and facilitated our research immensely. Our fellow researchers, Jose Orozco and Kaden Ricker, my cat, and the stick knots that give up their lives to be broken by research. Um, now I'll pass it off to Ambrose and he can answer any questions. Okay, thank you. All right, let me make it so folks are able to unmute themselves as they so choose. So let's open up for any questions we might have. So I'm not super far in the math. So some of this did go over my head, but it sounds like basically the, the what you accomplished was showing that you have to add more sticks to make the stick not projection work, like with the Z positive Z negative thing, because otherwise it's just a bunch of lines that contradict themselves. Um, so yeah, that. Um, which means that you're not able to use straight lines in those particular circumstances for that number of, uh, uh, what is it, angles, points? I forget. <laughs> um, but uh, I was wondering uh, what further applications uh, might you uh, be able to do with a more accurate stick knot uh, projections? What we would hope in our research is that we, um we didn't complete, you know, there's a lot of still work to be done on this subject, but what our goal was is that um, with our research would help further along the steps toward being able to answer on um, the question of what the minimum stick number is uh, for a given stick knot, so that if you remember back at the trefoil, you know, we knew how many sticks is needed to represent this minimally, but um, for any knot, we want to find out what the minimum, minimum number of sticks is. Um, so yeah, that's what we were hoping to accomplish by our research. And of course, there's still a lot of open questions, but yeah. All right, cool. My only other question is, can I see Vitor's cat? <laughs> is the, are they available? Yes, awesome. Magical journey through Vitor's house in search of cat. Uh, oh, there they are. Awesome. All right. <laughs> they, they look like, hey, what are you doing? I was taking a nap. Oh, I love cats. I actually have too many cats right now because uh, we took in a couple of strays. So cats right. are awesome. Yeah, they can be inspiring and comforting. <laughs> when we were like stumped on a particular research problem, we'd be like, Come here, cat. <laughs> oh, yeah, they did, they did their part. Anyways, this is pretty cool to sit through. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and head out though. Have a wonderful day. All right, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay, great. I'm gonna go ahead and 